Judges chapter number 2, begin reading in verse number 7. The Bible says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnatherus, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of a hill called Gaash. <clears throat> And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Now, let me catch y'all up to speed. God raises up Moses. Everybody remembers the burning bush. Okay, he says, hey, go down there to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. Pharaoh was a little hard-headed. The uh, plagues come. Eventually, Pharaoh releases God's people. Then, changes his mind, tries to run them down at the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. And then, while the ground was drying, because the Bible says that a great wind blew, it parted the Red Sea, and then they walked across on dry ground. Well, that took a little bit of time. And I'll always remember that message, Brother Jeffrey Phillips preached on God's got my back why because while they were waiting for the Red Sea to dry out God in that pillar of fire made a wall of fire kept Pharaoh and all of his men from pursuing after Israel all of Israel crosses over they got all the riches of Egypt with them then they get to the wilderness they send some spies out to Canaan spies come back ten of them said hey there's giants there's strong people down there We've been slaves for 400 years. We don't know how to fight. There's no way we can go down there and whoop them. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, come back and said, Hey, God's on our side. Not going to be a problem. Well, because of the doubt and the disobedience of the generation that came out of, out of Egypt, Israel had to wander the wilderness for 40 years for that generation to die off because they were hard-hearted and stiff-necked and didn't want to believe God on faith. They wanted proof. Well... Along that way, God's man Moses disobeyed God. He didn't do what God... He didn't do the opposite of what God told him to do. He did what God told him to do and then some, which is still disobedience. God told him to stretch forth his staff to a rock and water to come out of it. That's why I hate that song, Take Your Shoes Off Moses, because God did not say to smite that rock. Because Moses smote that rock, that's why Moses died in the wilderness and didn't get to see Canaan land. Right, well, Moses dies, that generation passes away. Out of honor and reverence, the children of Israel take the bones of Moses and said, well, he didn't get to see the promised land, but we're going to bury him in the promised land. They take the ark. They take the tabernacle. They find the cross over Jordan. Joshua's in charge now. Then things like, you know, the battle of Jericho. Well, what was that? They walked around the city a couple of days and then a whole bunch on the seventh day and God made the walls flat didn't say that the walls fell down the walls were made flat I've said this before if a wall crumbles you've still got a whole bunch of bricks and rubble and everything else you've got to climb over the Bible says that they walked into the city because the walls were made flat didn't climb over it they just walked in well what are you saying brother Jordan I don't know but God made them fall down flat Right? Maybe they're so heavy they left an indent in the dirt that was just deep enough that they could walk across like it was a road. But they walked in. They didn't climb. They didn't have to struggle their way in. All defenses were taken. You can defend a hill, a pile of rubble. If you want proof, go see any of the you know, footage that survived World War II. A lot of times guys were taking shelter behind things that normally you'd think, well, you'd want something better than that. That's all they had. And they made it work city of Jericho had done the same thing but from then on everywhere that God's people went they're fighting they're being oppressed they're having to literally fight for every inch of what God gave to them now why are they having to fight for it because God's people beforehand didn't do exactly what God wanted them to do as a result, now they have to go and they got to 
get it instead of it being given in fact verse number I think it's two of this no it's not number two verse number three of chapter number two wherefore I also said I will not drive them out before you but they shall be the thorns of your side and their God shall be a snare unto you in other words God said it'd be too easy if I just made them all disappear if you want it you got to walk by faith you got to live by faith you got to do by faith he says they're going to be thorns thorns can't kill you if you know what you're doing if you're paying attention thorns aren't going to keep you from getting where you need to be you may have to take a different route you may have to do a little bit of pruning a little bit of hewing but you can get through the thorns didn't say that it was a roadblock that it was a you know impenetrable barrier they weren't going to be a wall to them just going to be thorns in their side right in irritation but as long as they did what God said God was going to take care of what they couldn't take care of and that whole generation of Joshua everywhere they went they saw the power of God they saw where God would deliver a message and he'd say if you do this then I'll take care of the rest and time after time he did Right, it all started when they crossed Jordan they had the ark and God said that to cross over Jordan well they didn't have boats so they said well if God wants us to go across we're going to have to walk but the water didn't part until they committed their foot to the water now committed the foot to the water means that there was no coming back it wasn't one of these situations they had their full weight and they were on the way down before the water parted the bottom of their souls were wet before the water parted and the whole way God said as long as you do what I said as long as you believe what I have told you it's all going to pan out the way that I said started at the river Jordan while they're out there in the middle of the river Jordan after it departed Joshua builds a monument out of stone everybody knows you can't just walk out there and build something so how to get there well that spot out there used to be dry and while we was walking across Joshua put up a memorial so that we'd remember at one point God parted it so that we could walk across on dry ground because it had been too much for us to bring everything across in all that water right it would have overtaken us we'd have died we'd have lost things but we came across safe and sound just like we was walking on dirt because they were well after years of that it says Joshua died when he was 110 then it talks about that whole generation of elders all of them went to their fathers that generation were the ones that went out and took the inheritance that God had promised them they had to go out and they had to embrace it that they weren't just all huddled together God said hey that part belongs to this tribe that part belongs to this tribe that part belongs to this tribe and they had it divvied up by well that person had this many kids it gets divvied up into this many portions everybody knew what their inheritance was but they had to go out and get it and they did and all of them firsthand experienced God's manifestation of his promise to them that they received what was promised to their great 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 grandfather Abraham and that as a result of that promise now they had something where once they were slaves they have something where they owned everything that they could see from their house they knew what it was to trust God and to receive the fruit of faithfulness does that whole generation that outlived Joshua says all the people of the Lord there are all the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua as long as them people was in charge they knew it's best to just trust God but then look with me in verse number 10 and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord Sir Balaam now see the generation after Joshua's clan right that's that's the if you will today 
the illustration of the past couple of generations after the baby boomers. Okay, people from 1910 to 1930 knew what it was to have everything, lose everything in the Great Depression. Grown men waiting in line for days at a time just for a morsel of bread or a hand out of government cheese. Everybody signing up for every job that they could get and having to claw their way back just to what they used to be. And you say, well, that's a very somber and sobering experience. Yeah. And it left an impact. Right then. Then World War II comes along. We're just out there minding our own business, and then out of nowhere, we're trying to help some people out and be friendly. We'll be like, yeah, if y'all want to buy, buy guns, we'll lend lease it to you. We'll ship them over there, but you got to pay for them. Maybe not today, but bills come and due at one point. Right? It's just business. We're not attacking you. We're not doing that. And then out of nowhere, Pearl Harbor gets hit. Right? In fact, the admiral of the fleet, Yamamoto, and later, many years later, his personal journal was found. He said, I fear the only thing we've done is awoken a sleeping giant and filled him with great fervor. Why? Because that was a, and then shortly after that, Wake Island. Go study that. How that was an impetus for there were 450 Marines out there in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of old equipment. And at first, they, had, they sunk two Japanese ships, destroyers. First, losses that the Japanese have had in their entire World War II campaign up to that point. And then on top of that, they made them turn tail and run. That is a lot like that story of the 300 Grecians, except it's a whole bunch of angry Marines on an island that handed it to the Japanese instead of the Persians. No way that they should have won, but they did. That became a rallying, rallying cry after Pearl Harbor. But then, the soldiers come back home, then we have the baby boomer generation to make up for all the soldiers that were lost. And there were people that knew how to pull yourself up by bootstraps. They were always taught the lessons of the previous generation to hate. Just because it's good today doesn't mean that tomorrow's not going to be bad. But you've always got to be prepared to handle something that you didn't think was coming your way. You say, well, that, that seems a little ver verbose, maybe, for lack of a better term, exaggerating. My grandma to this day has a bunker in her basement full of canned foods and everything else that you can imagine. Right? Because she remembers when recessions and depressions hit. And she remembers when, well, hey, we don't know if we're going to have food tomorrow, so we better buy twice as much as we need today, make it last. But half of that stuff's expired, and she don't even know it. She can't even use it, but she, she knows, better be prepared. You say, it, but Jordan, the world would say that's neurotic. No, it's just how they were raised. They were raised to be prepared for anything. Because one day everything could be sunny, you know, sunshine, rabbits and deer dancing out in the field, okay? And then next thing you know, Pearl Harbor happens. The next thing you know, a September 11th happens. Something unexpected. Wasn't even on your radar. Which, if you know anything about history, that's a good pun about Pearl Harbor. Because they saw a whole bunch of stuff on the radar, but they thought it was birds. Ended up being the Japanese. It was on their radar, but they weren't ready for it. Didn't know what to make of it. Well, that's that generation with Joshua. They've been asked to do a lot of things that don't make sense to the flesh. They've been asked to walk and step on faith for things that they thought, well, there's no way that we're prepared for that. But God said, I know you're not prepared. Just follow what I've told you. I'll take care of the rest. And time after time, he delivered. He conquered. He drove out. And so they know, regardless of what's coming, the only thing that's going to keep you prepared is faith in the Lord. To do as thus saith the Lord. But see, that next generation, in verse number 10, 
says there arose a gener another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel it's one thing to know the right thing to do it's another thing to teach others the right thing to do so that generation that knew what it was to grow up in the wilderness and for 40 years their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out and manna fell from heaven every day and then quail came that they had to live on faith they could only go out and take what they needed for that day they remember crossing across on dry ground where once there was the river Jordan they remember seeing the walls of Jericho come down flat they remember all the times that God did great and mighty things but they never instilled it in the people that came after them you see after the baby boomer generation in the 70's there was a little oil scare but for the most part America been coasting for decades things been good right we're reaping what those that came before us sowed but somewhere along the line the church just assumed that because people are around it because they're living off of the benefits of it surely the next generation gets why this is so important but see the problem with that is if you're in something it doesn't mean that you're a part of something this next generation is in the promised land they's in the group of God's people Right, they're living off of the milk and honey of Canaan land with the bushels of grapes so big that they had to be born between two guys. They're looking around and thinking, man, this is awesome. But they didn't understand the price and they didn't understand why they had what they had. The price was that because of unbelief, a whole bunch of the promised people, God's chosen people, because he promised Abraham that his seed would be as the stars in the sky, God promised that that generation would come around. But yet they didn't want to believe God. They wanted to make their own gods. They wanted to control their own destiny. What happened to them? They were slain by Moses and the Levites. Then those that still didn't believe, they had to die of natural causes in the wilderness. They didn't get to see what God had promised. Because they wanted to see in order to believe, but those that believed were the ones that ended up seeing But then this generation comes along and the generation before them knew a whole lot about faith. And so even after Joshua was gone, God's man has left the scene. He's sleeping with his fathers on the backside of a mountain in Ephraim. Right? But even the elders had enough character that even after the leader was gone, everybody still continued to do what was right in the eyes of God because they led the right way. They made the right decisions. Right? They lived in God's favor. But they never instilled in the next generation why it was important to continue doing what it is that they did. See, this next generation, it says in verse number 10, it says, which knew not the Lord. In the wilderness, God went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In the wilderness, God would hover over a mountain and tell his man to go up to the side of the mountain. And thunderings and earthquakes and lightnings would be heard, and then he'd come down off the mountain, and he'd have the word of what thus saith the Lord. He did all that to strengthen the faith of Israel. But this new generation, they've already received what God had promised. They already had the law that God had given to Moses. They had been victorious over all their enemies. They had never seen God come down and meet with His people. Because God had already told them everything that they needed to know. They didn't know what it was to be in the presence of the Lord. They didn't know what it was to see a pillar of cloud and somebody would tell them, don't go near that. That's the Lord. He's more than that. He's greater than that. But He's leading us. The Bible says that when that pillar of cloud came to the tabernacle and 
God spoke to Moses out of the pillar. It said that he talked to Moses face to face as a friend. God was in the middle of that pillar, but he was a whole lot bigger than that pillar. But see, this next generation didn't know what it was to have God in the camp. To have God on the property. They knew what was right to do. They knew what was taught. They didn't know why it was right to do. That's not what your grandparent, that's not what your dad, that's not what your uncle or the elder in the community taught you. That's what thus saith the Lord. They knew about the Lord, but they didn't know the Lord. They had a title, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were God's chosen people, but they had no relationship. It wasn't personal to them. Well, why wasn't it personal? Second part of it, well, third part of verse number 10. Which I knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Nobody took him back to those monuments that other people set up. Said, hey, you see that big pile of stones out there in the middle of the River Jordan? How do you think them got there? Well, I don't know. That doesn't make sense. You'd have to block off the whole river to get out there and to build something. Yep. That's what God did. Hey, you see that city over there, the one that's raised and now it's just a bunch of rubble? That thing used to have towers that were impenetrable. Walls that couldn't be breached. And God made them flat. And we went in. We took all the spoils of the, the city. We took care of them. Not because we were strong, but because God did it for us. There were some spies that were sent in. And because a woman forsook everything that she had known and she embraced that God was the real God, she got to become a part of God's people. Her name was Rahab. She protected the spies. It wasn't because she was the you know, queen of the city. In fact, she was a harlot. It wasn't because she was the wealthiest. It wasn't because she was you know, the most beautiful. It's because of faith. Faith is what redeemed Rahab. Faith is what crossed the Jordan River. Faith is what delivered to you the piece of property that you're standing on. It wasn't instilled in them. Then it says that they did not yet know. God taught them who God was. They reminded them. But see, it was just history lessons to them. Right? Why do we got to be worried about fighting people? Everything that we see, we own. But there are no enemies. Well, the generation before knew why, because God drove them off. But they also knew the promise that we read in verse number 3. There's going to be a thorn in their side. They's coming back. How many times did David have to whoop the Philistines? Right? Now, you just go a couple of chapters. How many times did Samson have to whoop the Philistines? But yet what happened? Another generation come up and they say, Ah, the last guys were weak. We can do this. We're better. We're stronger. And they'd come back and hit Israel again. But every time you find when Israel was right with God, Philistines were no more than just a thorn in their side. Right, a little bit of gravel under their feet instead of smooth pavement. It was a little bit bumpy, but it wasn't anything that God couldn't handle. But see, why did this generation, verse number 11 says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And more so than that, they returned to the ways of the generation that died off in the wilderness. They served a false god. What did Israel do when Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? They broke off the golden earrings in their ear that marked them as slaves. And they made their own God that they would be a slave unto. The golden calf. They took the things that marked them as slaves and they wanted to become enchained to something that was false. The Lord said, we ain't having that. If you don't believe that I'm the one and true and only God after everything that you've seen in Egypt, there's no hope for you. That's what he said. He wanted to kill all of them. Not just the ones that made the fatty calf, but all of Israel. And he told Moses, we'll start over with you. Moses said, Lord, you got too much grace and too much mercy to lead your people out and then to kill all of them. Then Moses saw what they did and he wanted to kill all of them. Well, he's saying they were a hard-hearted people. Granted, they'd just been spoiled. 
they left with all the riches, all the livestock, all the fine apparel that Egypt had to give. They loaded it up and took everything with them. Well, this generation, the one that came after Joshua, what are they? They're spoiled. They've got everything that they could ever hope, want, or dream of. They're in Canaan land. The land that flows with milk and honey. They've got the grass that is greener on the other side of the hill because God made it that way. They've got everything that they could ever desire or dream of ever needing. So when it comes their turn to start making the decisions, what happens? Ah, that, that, that old way, that's oppressive. It's restrictive. It's not convenient. We're going to do what we want to do. Balaam lets us do whatever we want as long as we give them stuff. Right, we're going to do it that way. Why? Because it was easier. Why did cell phones come about? Because it was more convenient to call from the car than to have to stop and pull over and find a pay phone booth and wait for that guy to finish talking to his girlfriend for 14 hours and before you could finally use the phone, right? It was just more convenient to have the bag phone. Well, then that was a whole lot more convenient instead of having to take, you know, half of your cabinetry with you for a battery that only lasts about 10 minutes to make that thing smaller to where you could hold it in one hand. It's still huge, right? It still had an antenna on the top of it like a CB radio, but it was more convenient than the bag phone. Then eventually they get it down to where it can fit in your pocket. But you know what's more convenient than talking? Just typing. So then SMS came about. What's that? It's text messages. And then... Instead of having to type out what you want to describe, we'll let you take a photo and send that because the picture is worth a thousand words. You can just send whatever you want to. Don't even have to talk to people no more. Right? You don't have to pretend to be happy. You can just text them and just be like, hey, here you go. Right? You don't have to play that game of, well, how's this person and how's that? Or you can just be like Jordan and not play that game. Right? Why'd you call me? How's this? I don't know. I haven't talked to him today. What, what do you want? All right, let's get down to business. Time is money. Right? And I don't like wasting money. That's not true. I buy a lot of stupid stuff. Anyway. Yes, much Star Wars stuff. See, Tommy thinks it's spiritual. But they spoiled they didn't have to fight for anything. The generation before that, had to fight for everything. And God knows that those enemies, they're coming back. They're going to be thorns. But see, if you run into a briar bush not knowing that a briar bush is coming, it's going to mess you up. It may not kill you, but you're going to be walking different for a while. If you get real unlucky, you may lose an eye. Lord help you if one of them becomes infected. What he's saying, something that shouldn't have been a problem can become a problem real quick. Something that shouldn't have been an issue for you if you had your eyes open and you knew what you was walking into. If you were prepared for it ahead of time, all of a sudden it can overtake you. In this generation, they know about the Lord, but they didn't know the Lord. They had not yet seen or been taught to remember the works of the Lord. Why was that? Because somebody along the way didn't instill the importance of what God had done for them. We're talking not five, six, seven, eight generations later. Okay, I mean, even in Egypt, it took a long time for people to forget who Joseph was, how God brought Joseph in under very strange circumstances. And as a result, God used Joseph not only to save all of Israel, but all of Egypt from a famine. And they respected God's people, but it took a long time. But eventually, people forgot who Joseph was, and they saw all these people living on the best land and taking all the best, and didn't understand why it happened, so they turned them into slaves, became cruel taskmasters. 
We're not talking about something that happened over hundreds of years. We're talking about one generation. And they already don't see the importance of serving the Lord. And saying, Brother Jordan, how are churches in the way that they are today? Because nobody instilled in the next generation how it was important for them to know who God was and what God did. They just thought it was important to get them around the things of God. You can be around it all you want to, but until you get in it, it's not going to impact you. You can be saved on your way to heaven, but unless you get into worship, worship don't mean that much to you. Unless you develop your own prayer closet, prayer time don't mean that much to you. Unless you study the Word of God, waiting for God to make something jump off the page, reading the Bible doesn't mean that much to you. Until you've had a bad day and you put in a singing tape or you put on a YouTube channel of some people that have been singing at the church, right, or you put a preaching, well, preaching CD, now used to, they were preaching tapes, Brother Randy, now <laughs> they're preaching CD, and then preaching flash drives on the new, newest ones. But unless you put a message in that was important to you as a hallmark and God starts stirring that memory, of the promise that God gave you or what God did for you before right meditating on the things of God isn't that important to you until meditating on the things of the Lord changes one of your days from being pretty awful and uh, it may be bad but we've been through worse and God's still good until yeah, you start counting your blessings you really don't realize how important it is to remember what it is that God's done for you to remind yourself of how needy you are and how without God how feeble you are that it's only by the grace of God that you're able to even have your own conscience and being let alone everything that he's given unto you you may have worked hard for it but it's God that gave you the ability to work you may labor but it's God that gave you the place to labor so that your labor would be rewarded you may spend lots of time praying and crying over those burdens, but it's God that gave you the burden because He knew that you would treat it seriously. Yeah, you prayed a whole lot, but it was the hand of God that did the working behind the scenes. The generation before these people understood that they were very small and God was very big. This generation thought that they were very big and that they could do some things and take some things off of God's plate for them. You've heard a preach around here about people thinking that they're Holy Ghost Junior. But I've read that He is the Lord Jehovah and there's none beside Him. Amen. So how did Israel end up in a shape that just one generation, they've already turned to a false God, they're doing evil in the sight of the Lord because the generation before didn't instill in them. They had them around the things of God. They had them in the place of God, the promised land. They had them around the people of God. But they never prepared them for the day that they'd be responsible for their relationship with God. Now what are you saying, Brother Jordan? This is back Old Testament times. They had a high priest, but also the eldest male of the family was responsible for offering up family sacrifices and they were the elder of the family they were the one that made decisions made judgments and rulings for all them around them but see they knew the right thing to do and they just assumed that the next generation would pick up on why it was important if that were so Jesus wouldn't have left and then sent the Holy Ghost if hearing it, if being around it, if knowing what God had done in the past was enough, you wouldn't need the Holy Ghost to convict you. You wouldn't need the Holy Ghost afterwards to lead and guide you into all truth. Because if being around it was enough, then Judas wouldn't have betrayed him. If being around it was enough, Thomas wouldn't have doubted him. God himself walked in the flesh and those that lived with him every day for three and a half years relied on him completely for everything that they needed. 
Some of them still fully didn't comprehend what it was that God wanted them to do. Even those that were better than the others, Peter said, Lord, you're not going to the cross. Get, get thee behind me, Satan. You want to stand in the way of what God's doing? They didn't understand it, yet they were around him 24-7, 365, for some three and a half years. He said, I must go so that the Comforter can come by because he's going to finally open your eyes to a few things. He's going to live down here so that it becomes personal to you. Amen. They just thought that Jesus was going to take care of all the problems and they was going to be with them for a long time. Well, they will for all of eternity. And they were through the Holy Ghost for the rest of their lives. But it didn't pan out the way that they thought. Well, this next generation, it didn't pan out the way that they thought. God sent the angel of the Lord down to deliver a message. What happened? He reminded them who he was and who they were. But they had to start from scratch. Where they could have been equipped. Where they could have been prepared. Where they could have had training. They had to start all over again. All that information was lost with the elders. Because they didn't think it was important. Why do you think it's so hard? Nowadays for those that are preaching right, teaching right, living right. To go out and make an impact in a community. Because they're having to start over from scratch. If we're not careful, the next generation will be worse. But we're fortunate that some stuck by the stuff. God always promised to have a remnant. And we're fortunate that God winks at our ignorance. That God looks at us and doesn't see what we are, but what we will be one day. And He still decides to meet with us. But if we just assume that because... But, but Doug's going to come in and preach a great message today. Yeah, He will. Not because He's Brother Doug, but because God knows that His people need something. We just assume that we're going to come in and the lights are going to be on. Well, back in the day, every now and then a squirrel would get in that transformer and they'd blow the lights out. Guess what happened? We still had church. Long before electricity and air conditioning was invented, people had been worshiping God. But that'd throw a burr in some people's saddles. They'd be clucking around like a wet hen. Well, it's just uncomfortable in here. A whole lot more uncomfortable in hell. Sit down and shut up. That's why people don't ask my opinion. Because being around it isn't enough to get it. What did the generation before, what didn't they do? They didn't take the time, not just on their dependents, but those around them. Those that were truly effective in the Bible, it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter where you came from. If they saw you, they'd tell you about the one that did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. I mean, go and study Naaman. He was a foreign fella. He came and he said, Hey, I've heard that your God can heal this thing called leprosy. Well, see, he got in so good. He had heard about it. He had been around it. But it wasn't personal to him until what? Until he went and he dunked in the water a couple of times and he came up and his skin was new like a baby. What'd he do? He took bags of dirt back home to him in a foreign land underneath of a foreign king he was a general but he went back to where he was from but what did he do he took God's dirt to make his own altar to God he made it personal he said I'm not going to make it out of dirt that God didn't touch I want God's dirt to go make an altar back at my house what did he do he took God with him metaphorically wasn't anything special about that dirt other than the fact that it is the promised dirt that God promised to Israel. He said, God's in this place. I'm taking a little bit of God back with me. It's personal. What does generation not do? They didn't instill in them the need to understand how things work. I remember a time when there was more preachers in this church than you could count on two hands. Not that way anymore. 
thank the Lord that we still got preachers. But I remember the time, right, and this is in my day. I can't imagine what it was like before that, ain't Lynn? But where young men would, you'd see them under a burden, and they'd finally surrender to preach. Why? Because God knew that somebody needed to hear. When's the last time that somebody was called to preach around here? When was the last time that a revival meeting broke out and somebody surrendered to a mission field? Well, he's saying, Brother Jordan, God hadn't changed. But see, we've come up and we've lived in a generation where church has just been easy. Because the generation before us, they paid the way. We're just reaping what they sow. Yeah, there's great preachers today. What about tomorrow? You really think that a degree from a Bible college is what makes you qualified to pastor? Ha! I've seen people that graduated from Bible college don't even know how to read the Bible, let alone study it. You really think that because you got all the right equipment that the singing's going to be a sweet smelling savor under the Lord? You really think that as long as you've got in your head something planned out that if the pastor calls on you, that's what you're going to pray to either open or close the service or if he asks you to pray over an offering. You really think that that's going to get the job done? I find that vain repetitions are a mockery. That they're just babblings. Nonsense. Right? Why does that kind of stuff happen? Because people think that it's all about form and not function. You can have the best looking car on the outside in the world, but if it don't have an engine, it ain't going nowhere. But you can have a hunk of bolts that's got an engine in it that's reliable every day of the week may not look like much, but it's going to get you where you need to go. Amen. It's about focusing on what actually moves things. What moves the heart of God? Sincerity, faith, and faithfulness. You can't come to God and have pretense and put on a show and expect God to be impressed. You've got to be sincere. You've got to be humble. Right? You must believe because God's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him but also is a rewarder of them that believe that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all they can ask or think. You don't diligently seek if you don't have faith. You just kind of meander around looking like most men do when they, somebody says, hey, go, go grab that over there. I don't see it. Why? Because they weren't diligently searching. Well, you said it was right here. Well, it's two inches away from that. Why didn't you see it? Because I was looking right here. But not only do you have to have it, you must be faithful. God's not about to blow in and blow out ground. He's not about keeping a time schedule. He's about faithfulness down here. Commitment. Nobody taught that to the next generation. Nobody taught them that it was important for them to be able to find out what the will of God was. Nobody taught them that it was important to keep to the old paths. To keep to the law. To eschew and to hate those false gods and those people. That they ought not to associate with them. Because they were heathens. They didn't know better than go out and do wrong. Do wicked. Right? They were barbarians. They did that which was right in their own eyes. And all it did was bring about death and destruction. They never told them that the only way that works is the way that he paved and he gave us the road map don't have many X's doesn't have any turn by turn you know instructions on it but in order to read it you got to use faith don't know what's going to happen between here and where you're going but I do know that God's already seen it and he'll prepare you for it it's better to stick to that map that road that's straight the way that's narrow rather than going out there and living on the wide road where only death and destruction are the result of it. We just assume that 
God would teach those that came after. If God wanted to teach them himself, why'd he leave you around after you got saved? He charged the church to disciple, to instill the doctrines of the Bible in them, but also to instill the importance of what it is that we do. Joshua and his generation knew that it was important. They lived it faithfully. But they never stopped and thought that the next generation may be missing some of the experience, some of the info that they were privy to, that if they didn't share it, it wouldn't become important to them. Because if God hadn't intervened, this generation would have done evil in the sight of the Lord continually. What do you think the generation after that would have been? And after that, and after that. Every now and then God makes a space of grace. Not much thorns. Not much resistance. Why? So that you can grow, you can mature, you can instill in the next generation. So that when the hard times come and faith is put to the test, they go back to the way that they were raised in their youth. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.